Previously in our retelling of the events of the First Age of Middle-earth, we detailed the ultimate culmination of the tale of Hurin Thalion following the destruction of his family due to the Dark Lord's malicious machinations. The consequences of the Curse of Morgoth were not at their end, and the realm of Doriath, which had long stood in defiance of the Lord of Angband, was to feel the combined wrath of the Curse of Morgoth and the Oath of Feanor. What if curses and consequences were not so inevitable? What if the timeline of Middle-earth was convoluted by the intervention of a new ring of power? That's what you'll see in the Lord of the Rings Heroes of Middle-earth, the new game from this video's sponsor Electronic Arts. It's a CRPG in which you collect Lord of the Rings characters to use in battle, both good and evil, reliving events from the canon storyline, but also original Tolkien-inspired stories, in which you, as a possessor of a ring of power that bends time itself, must visit and alter iconic moments from Middle-earth's past. Only by bringing together characters and creatures from across Middle-earth will you create perfect teams for each challenge you face, creating the ultimate Lord of the Rings universe crossovers. On June 26th, the first legendary character will be added to the game, Elrond. There will be a limited time legendary adventure event to unlock him, so before it starts, you need to collect at least 5 elven characters so you can take part. Get Elrond to use his healing abilities, including the ability to revive fellow elves, and he gets good synergies with his family members, like Elrahir, Eladan and Arwen. You can get the game for free right now by using our link in the description, or scanning the QR code on screen. Go prepare for the arrival of Elrond, and plenty more legendary characters in the future, in this new Lord of the Rings game. Hurin's final gift to the kingdom, which had fostered his family during his imprisonment in Angband, was that of the treasure hoard Glaurung had amassed in the aftermath of the destruction of Nagathrond. Foremost among these treasures was the golden necklace the dwarves made for Finrod, Nauglamir. It quickly became the second most important item within the halls of Menegroth, with only the Silmaril of Beren and Luthien proving more valued. The Horde had been cursed by Mim the Petty Dwarf before his murder at the hands of Hurin, and as such, it invoked in one of the noblest of the race of elves in their first age, great greed and longing. King Thingol, enthralled by the astonishing beauty of this jewellery item, looked to its original creators to conduct the works he had come to envision. The Dwarven convoys often passed through his kingdom. Unfortunately, the most recent convoy of dwarfs from the city of Nogrod had among their number great master smiths. Upon their arrival within the girdle of Melian, the king instructed the Dorvan smiths to set as the centerpiece of the Nauglamia the jewel of Fionor, the Silmaril. This required the reworking of the item itself, and such work was difficult and dangerous. The process eventually brought out the natural greed of the Dorvan smiths, who, as they looked upon the work of their forebears, in conjunction with the great jewel recovered by Beren and Luthien, began to lust over the soon-to-be reforged Nauglamia. During the painstaking process, Thingol sat in silence among the smithies of Menegroth, increasingly affected by the Horde's curse, and allowed no other elf to witness the works of the dwarfs. In time the work was completed, and the reforged Nauglamia's beauty became incomparable in its splendour. Upon its completion, the King of Doriath stepped forward to claim for himself the finest accomplishment of his reign. The dwarves, however, refused the king the item they had been forging, presuming that it rightly belonged to Durin's folk as the original creators of the Nauglamia. Thingol would not accept this, believing it to be naught more than a ruse by the dwarves to claim for themselves the Silmaril which had been won at great cost by the valiant efforts of the man Beren and elf Luthien. His words were full of outrage. How do ye of uncouth race dare to demand aught of me, Eluthingol, lord of Beleriand, whose life began by the waters of Cuivenan years uncounted ere the fathers of the stunted people awoke? Thingol stood amongst them proud and tall, yet this pride would prove to be the undoing of his reign and kingdom for his comments had stoked the embers of Dwarven lust into a full-blown rage. So it was that noble King Thingol was slain by the Dwarven smiths within the very darkest depths of Menegroth. His last sight, before he passed on, was the Silmaril, 
now prominently displayed within the Nauglamia. The Dwarven companies of those days were well armed and armoured, yet deep within Doriath they were left with no choice but to flee eastwards. However, the elves, enraged by the murder of their king, would not allow such a crime to be left unavenged and hunted the dwarfs, slaying them at will, until the Nauglamia had been recovered and returned to the heartbroken Queen Melian. Unfortunately for the denizens of Doriath, two of the dwarves who had participated in the murder of Thingol had survived the pursuit and made their way to Nogrod. Here they detailed what they deemed to be an affront to their people, and the leaders of the city lamented the death of their smiths to such an extent that they were driven to rage. Thoughts of vengeance were brought to the forefront of their minds, and although the sister city of Belagost refused the maid and counseled against violence, the die had already been cast. A great host emerged from the city and headed with all haste westwards over Gelion towards Doriath. The death of her beloved husband Thingol had also impacted Melian so drastically that the girdle that had long kept the kingdom safe failed. Melian spoke only to March Warden Mablung and bade him to seek out Berian and Luthien before she finally passed across the Westwood Sea, returning to the land of the Valar. In the absence of Melian, the leaderless elves of Doriath were left unprepared as the Nalgrim, as the elves called the dwarfs, crossed over the Aros and fell upon their hated foes. The ferocity and anger of the dwarfs of Nogrod were such that they swept aside the purposeless and despairing Grey Elves with ease. Before long, the dwarves crossed the Great Bridge and made their way to Menegroth, where the Battle of the Thousand Caves was to ensue. A great many elves and dwarves were slain in this battle, foremost among them Mablung, who was laid low before the very doors of the treasury which housed the Nauglamia. With the death of the foremost captain of Doriath, Menegroth was then sacked with wild abandon and the Nauglamia with its Silmaril was taken by the Nalgrim. Word of the sack soon reached Beren and Luthien, who now dwelt upon the green isle of Tolgallon alongside their son Dior Eluchil. Upon hearing of the fall of Menegroth, Beren, with his son in tow, headed north to the river Askar, accompanied by a great number of green elves of Assyrian. This company proceeded to ambush the returning dwarves in what came to be known as the Battle of Sarnathrad. The dwarves, laden with the spoils of war, began their ascent of the Gelion, only to be met with the blaring of elven warhorns and innumerable arrows feathering the convoy. A vast number of the dwarves were slain in the early onslaught, with only a scant few escaping towards Mount Dolmet. However, they would find no respite upon its slopes, as the shepherds of the forest, the Ents, came against them with force, once more driving the host towards the woods of Eret Linden. From there, none of the Nalgrim would ever emerge, as the great sack of Menegroth was avenged, and the Nauglamia, with its Silmaril, recovered. Beren recovered this trinket in what was to be his last battle, for he was the one who slew the very lord of Nogrod and reclaimed the Nauglamia. However, with his final breath, the dying dwarf laid a further curse upon the cause of the conflict, which Beren did not heed, it would seem. Following the battle, Dior Elohil bade farewell to his parents, and with his wife Nimloth and their children, Elored, Elorin, and Elwing, moved to Doriath, taking up the throne of his grandfather. The successor of Thingol would proceed to uplift his downtrodden people and restore the halls of Menegroth and the might of Doriath. However, this was not to last. For with the dying days of summer on a brisk autumn night, a messenger came and knocked upon the doors of the great hall in Menegroth, demanding an audience with King Dior. The messenger revealed himself to be one of the lords of the Green Elves, who had made with all haste from Assyrian, which provided a clue into the dire nature of the news to come. The door wards admitted him to the great hall, where the king sat alone, and, unwilling to break the deafening silence, the Green Lord handed a coffer to Dior and left wordlessly. Within the coffer lay the Nauglamia, which had graced the visage of Luthien up until this point, which broke the King's heart. Therefore, upon opening the coffer, Dior was made aware that Beren Achemion and Luthien Tenuviel had died their second and final death, leaving Arda to go to a fate known only by the race of man beyond this world.
In his unknowable grief, the young king gazed long and hard upon the Silmaril. This mighty duel represented for his people the triumph of hope over despair, through the ceaseless efforts of Beren and Luthien to overcome the terror wrought by Morgoth. In the years since, it has been theorized and accepted among the wisest of Middle-earth, the Silmaril hastened their end. As the flame and beauty embodied by Luthien when she wore the Nauglamia were such that it should not have existed in mortal lands, its brightness, in the end, bringing a final darkened day to the tale of Berin Hamion and Luthien Tenuviel. Unaware of this fact, Dior repeated his parents' mistake and clasped upon his neck the Nauglamia. In doing so, he became the fairest of all the children of the world he inhabited, with none of the Edain, the Eldar, or the Maiar of the Blessed Realm capable of matching his majesty and grace. However, this was not the end of the misfortune which would befall Dior Aluchil and his people, for rumours of the king's splendour now raced across Beleriand, as many stated, a Silmaril of Feanor burns again in the woods of Doriath. The rumour was to have devastating consequences for the kingdom, which had barely survived the earlier sacking of Menegroth, as it drew upon the king the ire invoked by the oath of Feanor. While Luthien bore the Nauglamia, it was not an issue, for none among the Eldar nor the Nalgrim were willing to assail such a beloved figure. However, as word reached the surviving sons of Feanor of the renewal of Doriath and the pride of its monarch, the Seven came together once more after years of wandering and set upon a single course of action the recovery of their father's masterwork from the resurgent kingdom of Doriath at any cost. The issue was initially raised somewhat amicably, at least by the standards of the descendants of Feanor, as they sent messengers demanding the return of the Silmaril. However, in his pride, Dior returned no answer, which provided the only pretext the warlike Kelegorm required, given the circumstances. Enraged to be rebuffed in such a manner, Kelegorm riled his brothers to such an extent that they agreed upon his preferred course of action, a direct assault on the kingdom, which now lay bereft of the protection afforded by the girdle of Melian. So began the second kinslaying. The assault was launched in the darkest depths of a harsh winter. The brothers fell upon Menegroth, catching the defenders unaware, with the element of surprise proving the deciding factor in this instance. Cutting down the guardsmen, the great sons of Feanor fought with Dior within the Thousand Caves. Dior displayed all of his father's martial prowess, combined with the gifts inherent within all of the race of Eldar, making him a formidable foe even to the sons of Feanor. He fought as one possessed and struck down Kelegorm with his own hand, with Curufin and Caranthia likewise finding their final ends within the Thousand Caves. However, this supernatural effort to hold back the enraged sons of Feanor was unsustainable. At the conflict's end, Dior and his beloved wife Nimloth lay slain. The servants of Kelegorm displayed the cruelty of their fallen master even in his absence, and seized Dior's young sons and left them in the depths of the forest to starve. Having fulfilled his oath to a certain extent, Maithros was somewhat freed from his father's power over him. As such, he repented in the face of his comrade's actions and attempted to save the children. Long did he search for them within the forest, yet to no avail, and the fates of Elurid and Elurin remain unknown. Doriath was left a smouldering ruin never to rise again. Yet in their brutality and malice, the sons of Feanor could not attain what they had long sought. A number of the residents of Doriath, Elwing among them, had survived the onslaught directed by Kelegorm. With this small remnant of Dior's people went the Silmaril, and they soon arrived at the mouth of the river Syrian by sea. With the fall of Doriath for good and all, only a single realm of great enough size to prove a threat to the Dark Lord and his forces remained. Gondolin, hidden within its great valley, yet stood, with its very existence in such dark days an act of defiance. Yet Hurin's actions had forever imperiled this mighty bastion of hope amidst an overwhelming tide of despair, a tide which was soon to wash over the free peoples. However, this is a tale for our next video on the history of the First Age. The next few videos in this series will be dedicated to the last desperate battles of this age, before the sundering of Beleriand in the War of Wrath. 
but we're planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We will try to read and respond to every comment as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.